So if it, it may not be entirely clear uh, how things are actually moving at the moment towards a close or an end, um, but things are things are definitely changing. So, and given it's been six months, Sean, um, it's good to just pause for a second and and see what's been achieved and therefore what more has to be achieved before this thing is over between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. Um, have the leaders, and we, you know, we talk about this a lot, have the leaders actually thought through what the future looks like once this is over? One of the frustrations, I think, um, so right, first of all, I think you're absolutely right, looking back at it from six months, it puts everything in context rather than reacting day to day. Um, Israel seems surprised that on the 7th of October, Hamas attacked. They seem surprised that there are over 200 people got killed. Um, they, and over, it sounds like 253 hostages were taken as well. But it wasn't so much that. It was the brutality, the acts of senseless violence, the rape, the burning, the, the decapitations. It, it wasn't a military operation. It was way beyond the law of armed conflict and shocked the world. Mm. But it is interesting looking back that we now know that Hamas was joined by five other militant groups that actually they'd been rehearsing since 2020. Um, so for three years... Um, and I suspect that part of the embarrassment of uh, Netanyahu and the Israeli leadership is that three years this was all happening, the most sophisticated military organisation in the region didn't pick that up at all and therefore got surprised. Regardless, um, they pretty much instantly declared war on Hamas. When you declare war, it's easy to say that, but war against whom? Um, was it war against the Palestinian people? No, 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 they claimed. It's war against Hamas. Mm. But Hamas, they've always described as a terrorist organisation. So from military parlance, that will be a counterinsurgency fight, not a war. And it's important because a war rub makes it difficult to discriminate between civilians and military. You know, that's why the Second World War, First World War, those analogies that... Netanyahu's been using to justify these huge casualty figures. Whereas if you're trying to surgically remove Hamas, it's a very, very different operation. But ever since that day, ground invasion, everything that came with that, um, it's worth the, the two metrics of success for Netanyahu was destroying Hamas and liberating the hostages. That's what he said throughout. Mm. Six months on, have they destroyed Hamas? Well, to all intents and purposes, Yes, there's four battalions of Hamas fighters left, but will Hamas ever be able to run Gaza again? No. Are they? Do they present a credible mm. military threat? Mm. Potentially. That's the. That's the. What you just said. That's the big thing. I've never heard anything so clear as that. That actually, yeah. from a, from a governance of Gaza for Hamas, that's the end. Yeah, and so the negotiations are more about a way of either getting the mass leadership gone or Operation Certain Death Starts, right. where. You know, go in. Second one is the hostages. The only time the hostages have been released mm. is during a ceasefire. Far more have been killed mm. during mm. the operation. Still 130 odd that are believed to be held. Probably only 80 that are still alive. Um, but the big picture here, though, is was it all worth it? They've had 33,000 people killed. Admittedly, we've only got one set of figures. 75,000 injured. You look at the pictures of Gaza. It's absolutely been devastated. Is Israel a safer place as a result of this? What is it? What is the world going to look like the day after the conflict? All the conflicts I've ever been involved in, and when we study them from a military perspective, your political leaders, before you go to war, what does good look like? What is that end state? What do you want politically the answers to look like? Mm. And the military create the security conditions to enable that to happen. Mm. If you don't have an idea of what that end state is, all you're actually doing is retribution. Mm. You're retaliating. 9-11 in Afghanistan. And that's exactly the, the analogy where Bush at the time, <clears throat> history would judge that he went in there angry that somebody had attacked American soil, angry that somebody would have the temerity to do that. Let's go out and hurt somebody. And in a way, there's a lot of analysts now saying Netanyahu looks like he's done the same into Gaza. Mm. Angry that he was embarrassed, angry that they surprised him, go in and kick the hell out of Gaza. But apart from assuaging his anger, what, what does it look like? What does the future mm. look like? What does the end state look like? If is it a two-state solution? 
which I think the vast majority of the international players believe is the only answer. Netanyahu doesn't want it. No. Nope. I mean, in, in as much as Hamas have any control at all, they don't want it either. So I, I'd, I'd like it. If, it, if if you could find sufficient leadership on both sides uh, to make it happen. But my concern would be with the other proxy capabilities from Iran, with Hezbollah and the Houthis and other actors, you know, Islamic State and so on, there's trouble everywhere at the moment. So once you think you've extinguished one fire, another one is burning. No, and I think what you're explaining is why I think a lot of, in the past, the international community has said it's a bit difficult. It's a Gordian knot of a problem. Um, put a bit of sticky plaster over it mm. and we'll, by the time it erupts again, I'll have moved on. So it's not my problem. As a political leader. As a mean? political leader. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas on this occasion, if it isn't a two-state solution, a one-state solution, where's the money going to come from to rebuild Gaza? Because traditionally it's always been Arab money that's flowed in. Um, it feels to me that the Israelis and the Palestinians are not going to be able to find a solution between the two of them. Too much visceral hatred. Mm. So this has to be a concerted international effort. One of the troubles before when um, Yasser Arafat was trying to negotiate a peace and he won the Nobel Peace Prize. But the picture was Yasser Arafat um, the um, Israeli Prime Minister and uh, Bill Clinton. Powerful picture, but Clinton was an ally of Israel. Yasser Arafat was on his own. Mm. It, it, it feels like an enduring and peace. Are, no? Yeah, it, it, you know, enduring mm. peace has to look on, has mm. to be mindful of Israel's security, prosperity, and hope. Where's the Palestinian security, prosperity, and hope? You know, I wish I were an expert, um, if indeed I believe in experts, but it seems to me like you need good, genuine, morally based leaders on both sides. And dare I say it, I think we're quite short of them at the moment in the, both territories. Is, but is it a failure of our form of democracy? I think Churchill famously described democracy as the least worst option. Yeah. One of the advantages of you know, the Russian style, the Chinese style, is those leaders are in place for 20 years. I'm not suggesting that's the answer for us, but there are some attributes to having long-term leaders because if they put a sticky plaster and the wound erupts again, they're responsible for it. So they do put more effort into finding mm. enduring mm. solutions to these. You know, Trudeau was asked many years ago, a comment he probably regrets now, um, the, uh, which of the countries in the world he admires most? And uh, he said China. And that's because when you want to get something done, you just do it. But there is, I, a, I, there is an interesting, it, he said, it's another for another podcast, I suspect. But in a way, China is looking in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Where do I need the commodities? Where do I need... The, they've got the plan. And know, they've got a plan for it, yeah. whereas we don't. We, 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 we muddle along. And I, I still think Churchill was right, but yeah, so it's a bit of a... And therefore, for this particular, you know, the, the bloodshed, this dreadful atrocities, I suspect from both sides, and yeah. the truth will eventually come out as to exactly what happened, what the devastation, etc. But if we, if the world is to avoid this happening again, it that feels like the, the world has to be involved I, in I the think solution. That's right. um, There's got to be, th in, as independent as you can possibly be, third parties who are genuinely driven by the need for peace and in, an enduring life of prosperity for everybody involved particularly those who will have suffered most from the But conflict. how do you impose that? Because I think there's going to be it's a degree negotiate. of imposing on Netanyahu well, and... Normally, the at the end of something, you negotiate with power on your side with the loser. It's not quite so obvious in this case. No. 